According to the World Health Organization, the average global lifespan has increased from nearly 67 years old in 2000 to 73.4 years old in 2019. Better health care, nutrition, and hygiene have all contributed to longer lifespans. However, these additional years are often dominated by poor physical health and cognitive decline. A groundbreaking project at Johns Hopkins University is trying to figure out what healthy aging actually looks like. I speak to the project's director, Dr. Jeremy Walston. Dr. Walston is a professor of geriatrics, medicine, and gerontology at Johns Hopkins. He leads the Human Aging Project, a cross-disciplinary initiative that supports research in biology, clinical care, and engineering. His interest in aging started early on in his life. I was most influenced, I think, by my childhood, of all things. I had great-grandparents and grandparents and sort of watched them age, and they did pretty well. And then I worked for a woman in Columbus, Ohio, who was actually the first woman to ever have been in the Foreign Service. So when I started working for her, she was 85 years old. And over four years, I really watched her decline and realized that the health services and the, and the, the training of people around her weren't very good for taking care of older people. So I looked into geriatrics and went in after that. And I think um, I've always been very interested in, in trying to figure out how to make older people less vulnerable. Uh, to health services and to, you know, in general, medical care. Diet, exercise, and sleep are all vital for health. An August 2023 study in the journal Sleep Health found sleep variability was associated with biological aging, but regular sleep can become harder as people age, sometimes from changes in hormones and the circadian rhythm, as well as mental and physical health conditions. I find that most people I talk to who are getting older have trouble sleeping, but sleep's important, isn't it? Sleep is absolutely important, and I think it, it becomes increasingly important as people age, and people are sleeping poorly. They're a little more likely to get confused. Uh, they're not as responsive to, to questions, and so I think it, it really is an under um, kind of utilized um, health issue. And if people are sleeping poorly, there are ways to address that. And I think it's, it's really important because it, do, it does matter with aging and, and especially with cognition. Diet. Um, it's interesting. I listened to a radio program you were on and, and one of your colleagues was saying, look, as you get older, you gain weight. And, and it seemed like the radio host really embraced that. Like, this is fantastic. I'm going to go have a pizza. And you were kind of like reining him in. But the fact is, as we age, we do kind of gain weight. Can you talk a little bit about that and diet? Yeah, so I think it's, it's you know, the, the, the statistics about getting older, and generally people gain weight as they get older, and they have more fat, more fat content in their body. Um, I think there is a limit, though. If, you get, if people get too obese, uh, then they really have a much higher uh, ability to get serious illnesses and lose function. So there's some sort of middle ground, um, I think, with, with that. And it's okay to gain some weight. And it helps people if they get sick sometimes because they, they have a little of reserve and weight. Um, but in general, the, most of the studies show that people that have healthy diets, less fat, less simple sugars, sort of more protein, more vegetable matter, they do better. They live longer. They're, they're a little bit thinner. Um, and they do they do great. So, and I think it's because it, it helps prevent the development of chronic disease states like heart disease or diabetes. And, and that, that's what keeps people healthier longer. Let me ask about uh, genetics. Is, is that, I mean, are, are things predetermined or can we kind of move the needle ourselves? Well, for longevity, there certainly are some genes that, that really push families into much longer life into their 90s and even low 100s. And that's we don't know exactly what all those genes are, but they're, they're certainly there. But the vast majority of people probably have you know, m gene mixtures that are not predicting that they're going to live to be 100 years old. So in that case, I think it's really important that people maintain their health and prevent the development of chronic disease states, continue to exercise and do everything they can do. And that, that I think, is what's pushing longevity and, and healthy 70, 80, and 90 year olds rather than the genes themselves. Working in this field, you've got to have a roadmap for the latter years of your life. What are things you think about 
that might also be attributable to the rest of us. Um, activity, continue to exercise, even if I don't feel like it. You know, I don't, I don't necessarily do like running miles like I used to, but making sure I do something at least three times a week to keep my muscles working. Um, engaging with friends and family, I think, is, is really important. It helps people's brain continue to function and, and not become socially isolated. So I think those are the two major things that I'm going to work to do. And also contribute to society. I mean, I think through church activities or uh, nature activities, working for volunteer community activities, those sorts of things, I think make me happy and, and I'll, I'll do that. In the United States, falls are the leading cause of death from injury for people 65 years and older. Each year, one in four older adults experiences a fall, according to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. When you're younger, uh, we all sustain injuries or we go through surgeries and all of that. But as you get older, it seems like the bounce back is, is longer. Are there things you can do to build resiliency? Yeah, so interesting, we're, we're just finishing up a big study on resiliency where we um, are looking at people who've had knee replacements or bone marrow transplants or new dialysis and trying to figure out what systems are most involved in uh, preventing them from, or, and enabling them to bounce back or having them decline after these major stressors. And they tend to be the, uh, what we call the stress response system. So. They're not specific organs. They're more things that like float between organs, like inflammatory mediators, um, the autonomic nervous system, and the um, what we call the HPA axis, which is the sort of flight or fight response. And uh, what we've learned is that people who do poorly tend to have those stress response systems turned on, and they stay on, and they can't. They never get turned off. So their heart rate's faster. They have inflammatory mediators. They're kind of more. They have more sleep problems. Uh, so what we're trying to do is to figure out how to um, reset those stress response systems. And hopefully, in the next three or four years, we'll have some better ways to do that because that that is ultimately what what resilience is all about. Uh, technological and engineering advancements. What are we seeing there? There's a lot of talk about AI. Do you think about how that might also contribute? Yeah, so we, we have a huge grant from the National Institute of Aging that we got at Hopkins uh, a couple years ago. It's an Artificial Intelligence and Technology Development Award. And basically we are um, funded to find pilots, small scale studies that help um, incorporate AI and technology into the care of older adults. So for the AI piece, it's usually taking a look at these huge data sets and seeing if we can find information on how to pick up maybe fall risk early or some mild cognitive impairment that's putting people on a downward trend. And if we can find those things earlier, we can, we can pull them out and start looking at the specific issues that are driving that. So I think there's a lot of that. There's a lot of, um, as people get older and are much more likely to be in their homes and not get out as much, um, there's newer observational technologies that can help people stay home longer, uh, help them communicate with family members. Um, so some of those sorts of technologies are getting better. And even like new devices to assist with balance and, um, and exercise so that people are less likely to fall or things that we're, we're looking at. So I think it's, there is a huge amount of potential. It's just really the dawn of that era. And I think as we get uh, further along, um, technologies in AI are really gonna be moving into these healthcare improvements for older people. Dementia is a general term that refers to cognitive decline, such as impaired ability to remember or make decisions. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention estimates 5.8 million Americans have Alzheimer's and related dementia diseases. By 2060, the number is estimated to rise to 14 million. My father-in-law uh, started to develop dementia and uh, he had a PhD. It was really a brilliant guy and, and he, I remember one time saying, you know, this is it's like my prized possession, I'm losing it. Um, and that's such a struggle with aging is, is losing the mental capacity. Are there uh, preventive measures people can take? Are there tells if you're living with somebody that suddenly you're starting to think maybe, you know, like forgetting the keys every once in a while, we all do that. But I mean, can you talk a little bit about this? Because I think this is always an area of concern. 
people, as they age, lose some memory, right? They don't, they don't have quite as, as much acuity of memory. Um, but as people develop more illnesses like Alzheimer's disease, there are more profound lack of short-term memory. Uh, the lo longer-term memories tend to say, stay intact. And so we have questionnaires and screening tools that we use for that. But if, you know, by the time people lose four or five points on one of these tests, um, then we, we would call it sort of early mild cognitive impairment and they're heading towards dementia. Um, Sometimes it's just severe Alzheimer's disease and we really don't know how to, to slow it. Um, other times there are other conditions that might be contributing to it, depression, um, uh, just sort of lack or severe stress in somebody's life, uh, recent deaths in the family or you know kids that are having a lot of problems. That tends to exacerbate that. So you kind of got to dig into what, what the issues are, and especially if there's something treatable or manageable, then you really need to, to help do that because that can slow that cognitive decline that people have. Um, you know, hopefully in the longer term, we'll learn how to prevent the development of Alzheimer's dementia. Um, it is important that people, you know, prevent their chronic diseases from getting worse, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, all of those things can make cognitive function worse. So. Um, it's, there's lots of things we can do. And I think it's important that physicians recognize that. Again, back to these kind of, each person is different and you gotta think about all of these factors that are influencing the brain and how to um, manage things like sleep or chronic disease states to prevent them from getting worse. The debate over how old is too old to be in office has been a hot topic recently in US politics. Dianne Feinstein died in September of 2023 at the age of 90 while still serving as a U.S. Senator from California. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell of Kentucky is in his 80s. He served as a senator since 1985. And President Biden, also in his 80s, is preparing to run for a second term in office. It's interesting, uh, Mitch McConnell, the Senate Minority Leader, had these, these freezes, he's in his 80s. Um, Joe Biden's in his 80s. There's so much talk about, oh, they're in their 80s. They're so old. They're so old. And yet uh, Donald Trump's 77. He's only three years younger than Joe Biden. And we never hear it about Trump, but you hear it about Biden. And I want to ask you about that. It, if in your 70s, are you one thing? In your 80s, you're another thing? I mean, is there that much market difference as you enter that next decade? Uh, in general, no. I think in general in the 70s is when people start to ha lose some of their functional abilities. Not necessarily cognitive abilities, but the functionality begins to decline most often in the 70s. And, and it just gets, you know, gets worse as people age. So um, I would say more importantly for this particular job is, is cognitive function and the ability to think through things and have experience that you can apply to bigger picture thing. So I think though that people do look at functionality on TV. They're not thinking about what's happening. They're, they're watching pe how people walk. And, and I think that's, that's probably part of the issue, sort of the <clears throat> ambulatory ability or health abilities that, that people observe. Um, even though that probably doesn't matter much for their cognitive ability and ability to make decisions and, and, and move things forward. So, so and I, I don't want to get political, but uh, but I want to ask a, a trained observer like yourself, what are the tells that you look for when you see any of these three people I mentioned, Nancy Pelosi, also in her 80s, when you see them on TV? I mean, what are some of the things you're looking for to say? Mm. Um, I, I think, you know, the functional issues are, are something that matter. But again, like, you know, people like FDR, basically he was in a wheelchair, but made great decisions about World War II and the government during the Depression. Uh, so functionality is not as important, I think, as cognition and decision making and experience in pulling groups of people together. So I think any of those individuals we just talked about are, are still completely capable of doing that. They've pulled people together in a job like the presidency or running the Senate. You have to have teams around you. You can't make all the decisions uh, without, without input. And I think as long as people are cognitively able to interface with people and make those sorts of decisions, it's fine if they're in the 80s. And there, are, there is, I think, a lot of ageism in society now. Um, and uh, sometimes that aging 
experience makes is a huge advantage for people because they've lived through a lot of things and they can help synthesize thinking a little better than younger people. How we age can be affected by our mindset about aging. A study by the Yale School of Public Health found older adults with mild cognitive impairment were 30% more likely to regain normal cognition if they had positive views on aging. So, it, uh, a final question. Um, I saw an old guy, I think he was in his 90s, and somebody said, well, what's the, you know, what's your miracle, you know, for the rest of us? And he basically said, you know, I, my entire life, I've always kind of, not my entire life, but later on in life, he goes, you know, I always felt like I was 29 years old. I just kind of approached life like I was 29 years old. And I think about that because I do know some people who are older who think about, oh my God, I'm getting old, I'm getting old. Whereas if you think you're 29 and you're kind of charging through life, um, attitude's a big part of it, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I would totally agree with him. I mean, he, he was right. I mean, people who tend to think of themselves as younger and continue to do things that they did when they were younger tend to do better in the long run. And that back to that woman I talked to, you know, she was 85 and driving a uh, in Columbus, Ohio, a 1968 Mustang convertible, right, at age 85. And she just was, you know, dynamic and and continued to do as much as she possibly could till she had some some health issues. But I think that is a really important point and people need to kind of Keep in mind that they're young and they can do great things, even if maybe functionally they're not able to do as much as they once could, but they can, they can maintain a lively and youthful life. Good news for me when I hit my 80s, I'm going to go out and get a convertible. Yeah, uh, thank you Mustang so much. Mustang convertible, right? <laughs> okay, thanks for having me.